title of this talk is Matching and Money, uh, and this is joint work with Alex Tableboy. Uh, the question that we address in this paper is when do stable matchings exist when agents can make monetary transfers to one another? Uh, it's been known in this setting since the work of Kelso and Crawford that stable matchings do not exist in general. And so there's been much further work on identifying exact conditions under which stable matchings do exist. Most previous work on this question has either assumed that there are no transfers or only discrete transfers available, or alternatively, that utility of all agents is quasi-linear in money. So that is that an agent's utility from receive, ending up with some amount of money and participating in a particular match is given by the sum of the amount of money they end up with and evaluation for the match. This quasi-linearity assumption is technically useful, but it's also quite strong. So for example, it rules out the possibility that agents can run out of money. Uh, and there are many settings in which the possibility of running out of money, uh, that is running into budget or other financing constraints is important. So for example, in settings like spectrum or procurement auctions or the recruitment of sports teams, there could be caps on how much a firm can spend, uh, which is a violation of this quasi-linearity assumption. In this paper, uh, we approach uh, the question of when stable matchings exist uh, and take seriously the possibility of budget or financing constraints. And our main result is a new existence result for stable matchings that allows not only for budget or financing constraints, but also for other forms of non quasi-linear utility. To give you a sense for the, some of the subtleties in our analysis, let me explain to you how budget constraints interact with uh, the key conditions that have been imposed in most previous work. Uh, so the key condition on preferences that most previous matching models have assumed in order to guarantee the existence of stable outcomes is the so-called gross substitutes condition. Uh, in the context of the labor market, for example, this condition requires that increasing the salary of one worker weakly raise demand for all other workers. So that is that raising the salary of one worker only make a firm substitute toward other workers. Uh, and this condition is quite useful because it entails that uh, Gale and Japley's deferred acceptance algorithm uh, yields a stable matching. However, when this gross substitutes condition is quite restrictive uh, when in settings with budget constraints. So for example, if consider a firm F who values two workers, call them W1 and W2 at $3 and $4. And suppose that this firm has $2 to spend. Now, if the salaries of both workers are $1 each, the firm can afford to hire both workers. And in fact, that's what the firm would want to do. However, if the salary of the second worker then increases by a little bit, say to one plus epsilon, the firm is only going to want to demand, only going to want to hire the second worker. That's because it can no longer afford to hire both workers and the second worker is more desirable. So what's going on here is that raising the salary of the second worker can make the firm stop demanding the first worker, which is a violation of the gross substitutes condition. And I mean, while this particular example relied on uh, this sharpness of the budget constraint at $2, one can get similar types of issues to arise uh, whenever there are income effects. So that is whenever the amount of money that the firm has affects which workers it chooses to hire. Uh, so given that we want to take seriously these budget constraints and income effects, uh, we're going to need to work with a different condition than the gross substitutes condition. So our approach is uh, to instead, instead of placing a substitutes condition on the solution to a utility maximization problem, to instead place a similar condition on, this, on the solution of a dual problem. So we're by no means the first to do this. This is, old, this is an old idea in economics. Uh, and when we have to, and the condition that we obtain in this way uh, is actually what's known as the net substitutes condition. So at this point, I can be a little bit more precise about what we do in our paper. Uh, so first, we develop a model of two-sided many-to-many matching markets with continuous transfers that allows for non quasi-linear utility on the part of the agents. So in particular, the model is going to allow for budget constraints. We then analyze this model under the net substitutes condition rather than under the more standard gross substitutes condition. 
And what we show is that stable matchings are going to exist. And in fact, are even going to be weakly Pareto efficient, but deferred acceptance is not generally going to yield a stable matching. And the familiar uh, and standard results, results about the structure of the set of stable matchings under growth substitutes are not going to hold in our set. And one thing I'd like to emphasize is what we view as the main methodological contribution in the paper, which is to show how uh, an approach that we developed in uh, previous work with, uh, with that's also joined with uh, Elizabeth Baldwin, Omar Adhan, and Paul Klemperer, that takes a duality approach to analyzing uh, exchange economies, uh, analyzing really competitive equilibrium in exchange economies with indivisible goods and income effects can actually be applied to shed new insights on uh, matching problems. Uh, so let me now start with, our, with uh, explaining our model. Uh, so there's gonna be a finite set B of buyers and a finite set S of sellers. And for each seller S and each buyer B, there's some finite set that we denote by omega S B of trades between S and B. You should think about an element of the set omega S B as an edge from S to B in a directed network of possible interactions. Uh, two examples to keep in mind are that a trade could represent a job contract without a salary. So that would be what it would represent in a labor market. Or uh, in an exchange economy, a trade would represent the good that's being exchanged as well as who is buying and who is selling it. Uh, each agent I is going to have, who could be a buyer or a seller, is going to be, is going to have a lower bound that we'll note by M lower bar I on consumption of money. So this is a lower bound on how much money I have to end up with at the end. Uh, and each agent I also has a utility function defined over two things. So defined over sets of trades. That's this first component, the power set of the set omega I of trades in which I is a participant as well as amount of money that the agent ends up with and taking values in the real line. We're gonna assume some technical conditions, which I don't want to get into in, the, in, in this talk. Uh, and the way, one way to conceptualize what this lower bound on consumption of money means is that if you take, if, if, I'm, if, 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 my, if, if, if an agent were to end up with strictly less money than this lower bound, the utility that they would obtain would be minus infinity. So this is just something that the agent would never choose to do. Uh, and each agent is also going to have an income or what one might also call a money endowment that we'll denote by WI. And we're gonna assume that uh, the income is strictly greater than this lower bound. So all agents have a little bit of money to spend and therefore that uh, at least a little bit of money to spend and therefore that the continuous transfers are meaningful. Um, so I'm gonna need to now talk about um, about these utility maximization problem and it's dual. Uh, so let me first by first start by recalling the standard utility maximization problem in this matching set. This defines what's called Marshall demand, and I'm going to focus on buyers. Uh, so given a buyer B and some income W, as well as a price vector P, uh, Marshallian demand is just defined by maximizing utility over all pairs of a set C of trades and an amount of money M that I end up with subject to the constraint that I can't spend more money than what I had at the beginning. So that is that the amount of money I end up with plus the total amount I spend on trades. So that is the sum over all uh, trades C in this set C of the price of the trade must be at most my uh, money endowment or income double. Uh, the dual uh, problem is just defined by flipping the constraint and the objective in the primal problem. And it defines what's called Hicksian demand. Uh, so to be a little bit more precise, given a buyer B, and now instead given a utility level and a price vector, uh, Hicksian demand just minimizes total spending. So that's this amount of money I end up with plus the total amount I spend on trades subject to the constraint of delivering utility at least you. And one can make a similar definition just with opposite signs on prices for sellers. So for sellers, instead of paying the price, they get paid prices, but it's exactly the same otherwise. So armed with these definitions, I can now be a little bit more precise about what gross and net substitutes mean. So again, I'm gonna focus on the case of buyers, case of sellers is analogous. What gross substitutes, this, the standard gross substitutes condition requires is that raising the price of any one trade, holding fixed uh, the, the buyer's income 
can never make Marshallian demand for another trade fall. So I'll never, uh, raising the price of one trade never makes another trade more, less desirable from the perspective of Marshallian demand. That substitutes is just the same condition except imposed on Hicksian demand. So it just requires that raising the price of one trade holding a utility level U fixed can never make Hicksian demand for another trade fall. So you might say, well, what's the big deal? These, you know, just two, these two conditions are so close, what's the gap between them? But it turns out that net substitutes is a substantively weaker condition than gross substitutes. Uh, so to give you an example, actually, it's an example that I brought up at the beginning, consider a buyer B who values two trades, omega one and omega two at $3 and $4 respectively and can't borrow and utilities otherwise quasi-linear. Then if this agent has $2 to spend, the gross substitutes condition fails, right? Because if the prices are both $1, the agent will want both. But if the price of the second trade omega two is slightly higher, the agent will stop demanding the first. It turns out uh, that th this utility function actually satisfies the net substitutes condition. Uh, one intuition as to why is that once one is fixing utility level, uh, the budget constraint is not going to bind in this sharp way. And the actual proof is a little bit more complicated than that. So if, if you're interested, I would, I, would, I would encourage you to read our paper. And it turns out that some, some kind of converse, uh, is, there's gonna be a converse to this. So I mean, this example shows that net substitutes is, uh, that net substitutes doesn't imply gross, but in a sense, gross does imply that. So we showed uh, in this earlier work with Baldwin and others, that if the gross substitutes condition holds at all incomes, including, uh, incomes that are that of that consist of less than this lower bound on money, then in fact the net substitutes condition must hold. So in in a sense, this net substitutes condition is a strictly weaker condition than the more standard gross substitutes condition. So enough about preferences. In the in the rest of the talk, I want to talk about how uh, stable matchings work under net substitutes. Uh, so I need to be a little bit more precise about what I mean by a stable match. And so what we're gonna focus on is what we call an outcome, which is just a set of realized trades as well as prices for those trades. So for example, in a labor market, what an outcome would specify is just a matching of workers to firms as well as salaries for all the hired workers. And uh, an outcome is stable if there's no group of agents who can commit to profitably recontracting among themselves. And their uh, agents are allowed to retain some, none or all of their contracts with outsiders. They can do whatever they want in that regard. This is, this is the standard notion of stable outcomes from Hatfield and Milgram as developed by others. And our main theorem is that under uh, this net substitutes condition for all income profile, stable outcomes are going to exist. So this concept of stability of course, depends on what income people start out with because that affects how, what payments agents can afford to make to one another. And this result says that regardless of what income profile you start out with, a stable outcome is going to exist. And the way we prove this result is via a topological fixed point document adapted again from this earlier work with Baldwin et al. And so what we do is we use this topological fixed point document to show the existence of a form of equilibrium called quasi-equilibrium. Uh, so quasi-equilibrium is a kind of dual to competitive equilibrium. It turns out it's actually a weaker concept. And basically what it requires is, I mean, so competitive equilibrium would say, uh, given prices, agents need to be maximizing utility. So they need to solve their primal problem. Quasi-equilibrium says that given prices, agents must be solving their dual problem instead. Uh, so this is, again, I think a, a place where this type, where this duality uh, that we really focus on in, the, in this paper with Baldwin and others crops up. And so we're able to apply an argument from that paper to show existence of quasi-equilibrium under net substitutes. And then we show that quasi-equilibria give rise to stable act. So one thing to note is this argument is topological. Uh, so it's not, gonna, it's not a constructive type of thing. And there's another sense in which uh, it kind of differs from standard arguments for existence of stable outcomes in other settings, which is that even though stable outcomes exist in our setting, it turns out that deferred acceptance may not find one. So to give you some rough intuition as to why, let me just remind you that kind of roughly how deferred acceptance works. Agents are gonna be making sequences of offers and firms have to decide whether or not to accept an offer. The trouble is that when gross substitutes fails, if I'm a firm, I may reject some offer at some point in the algorithm and regret that later. So it may be that I reject an, off, an offer now and that later 
I receive another offer, which would have made the first offer desirable. And whenever one has this type of issue, deferred, the deferred acceptance algorithm is not going to work well. And the fact that deferred acceptance fails in this context also means more generally that one can't use monotone methods to analyze stable outcomes. Right? So that's kind of why we need to do things via a topological fixed point argument instead of using lattice-based fixed point theories. Um, so in the paper, we show some other results. Uh, so for example, we show that stable outcomes are weakly parade efficient under net substitutability. And we also relate uh, stability to several other solution concepts. However, we also show that uh, the set of stable outcomes is not going to have some of the familiar structure from the uh, setting with growth substitutes. So the conclusions of these lone wolf or rural hospital theorems uh, from classical matching aren't generally going to hold in our setting. And furthermore, the set of stable outcomes is not going to form a lattice. So while, while, existence, uh, while existence is going to hold under net substitutes, lots of other aspects of matching under growth substitutes do not carry over to net substitutes. So to conclude, I think the starting point for our analysis is that we think that net substitutes is a more uh, appropriate solution than growth substitutes, uh, a more, more appropriate condition than growth substitutes. Uh, for thinking about matching markets in which agents have experience, have budget or financing constraints or otherwise experience in your markets. And under this net substitutes condition, we're able to show some positive results. So we're able to show that stable matchings exist and are weakly Pareto efficient. So they exist and not, they, the behavior of them is not completely crazy. However, monotone methods, the monotone methods that have been that, uh, that are typically applied to analyze stable matchings don't work in this context. And the set of stable outcomes lack structure. So in ongoing work, what we're thinking about is what happens uh, when there are frictions or other taxes uh, in, in, in these settings so, so that um, transfers are no longer costless. Agents cannot perfectly move money between each other. And this question has been previously asked under growth substitutability, but we're investigating how the answer changes under net substitutability. And I think one open question that comes from uh, that, that comes out of this analysis is to think about what algorithms could be used to find or at least approximate stable outcomes. Right? Because this is a setting we, we've just used a topological fixed point argument to solve a problem where under under more standard assumptions, one would have used monotone and therefore constructive methods. Uh, so thank you all for listening. Let me just close with a picture of some of the results that we have in the paper.